Welcome to episode 16, Barriers to African Americans Accessing Outpatient Mental Health Services by Tia Briscoe, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. From Clearly Clinical, learn, grow, shine. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this wonderful course dedicated to working with African Americans in the outpatient setting. I'm so glad that you decided to join me during this course. My name is Tia Briscoe. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in California, and I will be your tour guide on this journey through these topics. A little bit about me and the reason I'm so passionate about what I do. First and foremost, I identify as African-American or Black, depending on the setting. Um, I don't have a huge preference, but for the purpose of this uh, course, I'm going to identify myself as African-American. So first and foremost, I'm African-American. I'm very proud to be African-American. Secondly, I am a advocate for African-Americans accessing mental health treatment, whether it be an inpatient or outpatient or ABA services. Um, I am a huge advocate of that. And so I spend a lot of my time helping uh, clinicians and those who are in practice really learn how to uh, bring African-Americans into the treatment setting, uh, some things that work really well with them, so on and so forth. So that is my goal in life, and that is why I completed this topic for you guys, because I think it's super important that we look at how different cultures or different groups of people really look at therapy. And so I don't speak for all African-Americans, but I will say that there have been some common trends that tend to come up when working with African-Americans that I've seen over my time as being an African-American clinician, but also uh, engaging in mental health services myself. Um, as you know, you can't be a therapist without having therapy. <laughs> so I, too, have experienced work in uh, doing with African-American therapists and non african American therapists. And so I've kind of gathered all the information that I've gotten this far over the time and have created this course to kind of give um, people who are interested in working with African-Americans kind of a sense of uh, where we are as far as mental health treatment. So with this course, I have a disclaimer. Um, when I say African-American or black, it really does not encompass all the different types of African-American and black individuals. You have African individuals, African-American individuals, black, Afro-Latinos and Latinas. It's a huge, huge branch. So one size in this case really does not fit all. Uh, but for the sake of this uh, course, I'm going to say African-American or in some cases I will say black. But just understand that there are so many different types of African-Americans, so many different types of Africans, Caribbeans, all of that. So just hang in there with me because I'm just going to go for the main two and uh, we'll move on from there. So uh, a little bit more about the course. I can go over the course description. So this course is a moderate level course. It's meant for pretty much anybody in the mental health field, psychologists, alcohol and substance abuse counselors, social workers, MFTs, LPCCs, PCC interns, associate marriage and family therapists, the whole nine. This course really encompasses uh, all the different types of mental health modalities that come out there. So if you're one of those or if you're another one that I did not list, this is a good course for you. So in this course, we're going to uh, really focus on several main topics, and those will be throughout the different uh, modules in this course. So module one really focuses on the barriers of treatment. Uh, Module two focuses on some treatment types that have been seen to work with African-Americans. And then the third one is going to be some of the theories that are really popular um, in African-American culture when working with African-American individuals. And so the course descriptions 
This is my favorite because I wrote it. As mental health professionals, we are often pioneers in finding the needed support for individuals who require the most support. During this time in history, African Americans and black individuals are seeking mental health services at a much higher rate than ever before. This course will outline some of the roadblocks that hinder African Americans from seeking treatment or maintaining treatment, ways to increase the likelihood of success in treating African Americans and treatment modalities that have been considered most successful when working with African Americans. While this course will encompass certain research that follows the African American journey in treatment, it is important, and again my disclaimer, to note that despite race or ethnicity, each person is an individual and will hold the key to their life changes. So again, I really want to uh, put that out there that while we're talking about a culture in itself, uh, your client is always going to be the expert. And you'll hear that throughout grad school. You'll hear that in consultation. You'll hear that your whole life, that the client is really the expert in their own lives. And so while these uh, topics that are brought up and the research that is brought up, it's kind of a generalized thing. You know, only use it to your client's advantage, if that makes sense. If it doesn't apply to your clients, then don't use it. But just to understand that each client is an individual, they walk in with their own stories. That's narrative therapy. They walk in with their own stories. They walk in with their own um, emotions and traumas and things of that nature. So just really understanding that uh, this is just a general overview of what may work with an African-American client or an African-American family in your in your care. Some other things we'll kind of look at and some special considerations, um, working with LGBTQ African Americans or black individuals, um, and also working with specific, uh, forms in uh, working with specific forms. So when I say specific forms, I mean working with uh, children, adults, families, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to try to incorporate all of that good stuff in there. Um, a lot of my personal research has been with African-American men engaging in therapy. I did my thesis project on that. I did my um, study after school on that. And so I have a lot of information about black men so you hear that a lot in this uh, module only because that's where the bulk of my research has come from um, because I'm really passionate about absolutely connecting black men to therapy with just the state of the world now. You know, we just had, you know, another young black male killed and, you know, a young black woman was killed in the Bay Area. And so the state of the world is really heightening the need for uh, mental health in african-american communities so that's what i'll focus on so if you're ready to take this journey for me let's kind of jump into uh the different barriers that come up in treatment and i call them barriers because they're they're almost there to kind of stop treatment or to not even let treatment begin but i say barriers because barriers can be moved you know as we all know there's so many wars and all that good stuff barriers can be moved so what I don't want is a clinician to see these barriers and think, oh man, I can't, I can't do therapy with them. There's no way I'm going to be able to reach or change how they view the world. Um, so that is important for me to really put out there that these barriers to treatment are not concrete. They can be changed. And a lot of times therapy is really the changing factor in somebody's life, having that support. But when we think of barriers, we're looking at both um, individual ther barriers, and then we're also looking at historical generational barriers. And so I'm going to look at uh, some of the barriers first that really impact individuals accessing treatment. And so the first barrier that really, really comes up for me when working with African Americans in treatment is really the access to care. Um, it's not per se more the access to resources like African Americans know about therapy. They know what mental health is, but they're not accessing it as much as they should be. So when I say access to care, it's different from access to resources. Those are the things that provide us with the information we need, the resources, but the access to care is more so um, not being able to get to mental health services. And so when I say access to care, it's, it's a generational problem. It's a systemic problem. 
Um, because in black culture, mental health has not always been a thing. It's always been more so a taboo thing. And so with the newer generations, they tend to access mental health treatment more than some of the older generations. Um, I consider myself a millennial. And so uh, my mom was very, you know, pro therapy. She was very pro. My mom is a therapist. <laughs> So she's going to kill me for saying that. But my mom is a therapist, so she was very pro-therapy, very, you know, go be a therapist and do well. And, you know, I understand the importance of it. My mom is a substance abuse uh, counselor, so she gets the importance of therapy. However, my grandmother, who just recently passed away and who was the most amazing woman in the world, did not understand my job in any way. <laughs> She knew I was a therapist, but she always kind of considered me to be a nurse. And so she would, I would tell her, like, Grandma, oh, I have to go to work. And she would be like, oh, yeah, my grandbaby's a nurse. <laughs> Grandma, I'm not a nurse. I'm a therapist. Um, but as she explained to me later on in life is that she didn't really have the the knowledge of what a therapist was you know they didn't my grandma's from the deep south my grandparents are from the deep south of mississippi and they didn't have therapy out there when i told her i was therapist, she was like oh, okay <laughs> why didn't you go to school to be a lawyer <laughs> but the the access to therapy treatment was just kind of unheard of in the deep south so then when we think about you know some of our older generation african-american individuals um, we really think that like the access to resources was something that kind of stopped them. So when we think of like our millennials and our Gen X individuals, we think it's the lack of access to care. And so when you have a, a younger person who may not have benefits or um, may not be engaged in the system that allows them to access these mental health benefits, it puts a strain on them. Luckily for, you know, the newer generations, there's things like um, texting therapy and video therapy where the access to care is not that far away if you don't have benefits or, you know, if you have to wait a whole month or two to get on a wait list for access to care. Um, so that leaves us in the sense of like, why don't we have enough care for these individuals? And so some of my research has brought me to these lower, uh, lower SES um, areas. For example, I come, I was born and raised in Palmdale in Lancaster, uh, California. If you guys don't know where that is, only thing I can tell you is that <laughs> Storage wars is thought out there sometimes, and there's a huge military base out there. It's a huge military uh, town that has grew uh, partially because of the prison system. And so when you think of the prison system, you think of prisoners being released, and therefore Palmdale and Lancaster has really, really high crime. It's one of the highest foster care uh, recipients in California. It's, it's a big deal as far as mental health treatment. And so being from Palmdale, I made it a point to go back to Palmdale and work with my community. And so I want to say maybe 80% of my clients were African-American children, which was really hard for me because, you know, most of them were in foster care or most of them had open DCFS cases or, you know, the whole list of things where I'm like, why is this happening? But again, it's a town that has two prisons. Um, so it it's almost kind of thought of that it's going to be that way. And so when I went back to Palmdale and Lancaster, um, you have the Palmdale, which is a, a higher SES, you know, there's shopping mall and all of that stuff. But when you look in the, the east side of Lancaster, which is actually where I was raised, um, it was a much nicer area back when I was raised. Um, they consider that a lower SES environment. And so the lack of care is so high in that environment that the agency that I worked for was severely impacted. They just had to keep hiring therapists because they were so impacted. You know, they had to go in the schools and they had to go, um, you know, in the homes and they had to come to the office to the point where it was so impacted because there was just not enough treatment for children. Now, when I think of adults, it's even worse. You know, there's so 
many treatment facilities for children, quote unquote, but there was rarely any for adults. And if you wanted to go into substance abuse, you had one, <laughs> one that everybody was fighting to get into. If you couldn't get in there, you were on your way to the emergency room and then you were put back right back on the streets. So when I say access to care, that is what I'm talking about. Meaning there are not enough facilities in African-American saturated areas to provide uh, mental health care, outpatient mental health care for individuals. Now, if you look at places such as where I work, such as Northridge or Woodland Hills or um, Camarillo, some of the nicer areas, there's more access to care. However, there it's high priced access to care. And so if you're coming from a lower SES environment, there's no way you can afford $150 per session or $200 per session or sometimes even $60 per session. And so it makes it harder for them to, one, access care in an agency setting, but even harder to access care in an outpatient setting. You know, so it puts us in a kind of a weird bind of how do we allow these people to get Care And I also hear this a lot in uh, the Latino and Latino, Latino and Latina communities that the access to care is very low as well, too. So when you think of your lower SES kind of environment, be aware that the access to mental health treatment is very low. And that's just it's not the only access that's hard to get. Housing is hard to get and food stamps are hard to get. So it's not just mental health care, but understanding that if those basic needs are not met, Nobody's going to go and access mental health care. Your basic needs need to be met first and then you'll access mental health care. And so I kind of decided to look at some studies that um, talked about what would happen if somebody didn't access mental health care. And so in my research, um, I found a, a article by Carter in 2007, and he asserts that Stereotype individuals, in this case our African-American clients, experience post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD-like symptoms, and are often used negative forms of coping, which in turn decreases their health and psychological well-being. So when we're saying negative forms of coping, uh, African-Americans have a really high rate of alcoholism and drug use. And so those are your negative ways of coping. I can't go seek help anywhere else, you know, or the help is not great, the help is not um, even up to par. So I'm just going to go drink my problems away. You know, I'm just going to go and, you know, smoke some meth and feel better about myself today, you know, but it's, it's sad because if there was a higher amount of access in the community, we have these resources again, but we don't have a lot of access in the community, then we probably would be a lot better off as a community. And so in another article by Brian and Ocampo in 2005, they indicated that racism has a similar traumatic and stressful symptom impact as rape and domestic violence. Clients who have felt the impact of racism have been found to have low self-esteem and are in consistent fear of being negatively stereotyped due to their race or ethnicity. So again, I wonder, where do these people go? Why are we having such a difficult time helping people access care. And so my final article, Tracy 2006, uh, this is in specific to black men. And so now we're gonna jump to the access to care from to the views of therapy. And so um, she states that black men tend to have negative views regarding therapy. So now we're moving into the, the not the access of care, but what are the views of therapy? And so I'm actually going to save this article as we journey into the next issue with engaging African Americans in services. And it really leads us to uh, understanding what mental health care is. Um, so when I explain to specifically children, because they don't tend to know what therapy is, they usually call me teacher, which is cute because I was a teacher for a long time. So it makes me feel good to still be teacher Tia. Um, but I have to explain it to them. And so I try to do it in a bite-sized way, how it was explained to me. So I asked my kids, when you go, when you have a stomach ache, where do you go? To the doctor. When your tooth hurts, where do you go? To the dentist. When your mind hurts or your emotions hurt, where do you go? 
that's where I come in. I'm a therapist. <laughs> and I mean, it sounds kind of juvenile, but it really explains like, you know, different things hurt on your body and you go to see people for different things. And so you go to me when your emotions and your mind is hurting. And so that tends to help them understand it better. I hope so. I mean, some of my kids tend to be like, huh? Why would I go to you? But anyway, so when we look at um, what therapy is, again, like I said, this is more of a generational problem um, because the access to therapy really didn't come up to like, I want to say the 70s or the 80s that people really started accessing mental health treatment. And really it came up because um, of like the AIDS epi epidemic. So people were getting therapy really because they were dealing with this disease and they were being alienated. And so it really started booming in like the 70s and 80s with African Americans because African Americans have such a high rate of AIDS and HIV, um, specifically African American gay males. And so it really blossomed, but there was still a huge misconception of what therapy was, um, what mental illness was, you know, what different diagnoses was. For example, I have a, um, a colleague who is African American and, um, she was doing a presentation with African Americans and she asked how many people knew what autism was. And people raised their hand, but nobody could explain what autism was to her. And so it just shows that we know what it is, but we don't really know what it is. And I say we because it took me a long time to really understand the different disorders and all of that. So African Americans tend to understand what mental health is, but not understand that mental health doesn't involve you to be crazy. And so that's the biggest misconception in uh, black families is that if you have to go see a therapist, number one, you're telling our business, especially if it's for a family issue. Oh no, you are telling our business. And number two, you have to be crazy. Like crazy people go and see therapists. And so even in talking to my own family, who I think my family is very progressive. And so they really understand because a lot of my family work in, um, mental health. Um, I have an aunt who, does um, work with with African American uh, youth and and specifically young ladies who have experienced pregnancy at a young age. I have an uncle who was a probation officer, so he uh, really and he was like the top, so he really had to deal with the mental health. Um, I just I've had a lot of people in my life who have you know dealt with mental health. So my family is very progressive. However, in a conversation, they were like, "No, we would never." We would never go. <laughs> and so everybody's like, Tia, you're our therapist. And so there's still this misconception of like, I wouldn't do that. Um, and like I said, the, the newer generation, the Gen X, the millennials, um, like I said, even my mom's generation, we tend to access treatment more. But even, you know, my mom's generation, they're still like, well, no, like, I don't know if I should go. And so when I look at my mom, who's a substance abuse counselor, it makes me proud because I'm like, you know, for you to come from a generation where it was still like iffy to go to therapy and for you to be a therapist, that shows a lot of growth. And so when we're talking about why the access is not there, it's really because we don't really understand therapy. And I say we because I consider myself a part of the community. And as a person who didn't understand what therapy was, um, we don't think that it's just for mild problems, you know, transitional problems or, you know, mild family partners, couples therapy, family therapy. It has to be something big in order for African Americans to really access it. And so as a clinician who I would hope would have some African American individuals in your practice, my recommendation is to really break down what therapy is and really make therapy a safe space and give explanation as to what you like to do in therapy and what you feel like works for the client. If you're gonna use a particular theory, really break that down. If you're gonna use CBT, it's how thoughts impact behavior and blah, blah, blah. That's how you can get the client engaged in it because if you're just like, well, thank you for coming in for mental health treatment. I'm gonna be your practitioner for today. They're gonna be like, huh? 
<laughs> and that's with any client to be a hundred percent honest. You know, you don't want to just go in the room and start blurbing off all this psychology today information. You want to really break it down into bite-sized pieces. And so for minority populations, um, not just African Americans, but a lot of minority population, therapy and what it means really has to be broken down because we have over time heard so many horror stories about going to therapy. You know, I had a, an older um, lady at church tell me like, when you had to go to therapy, your kids were going to be taken away. That was like the main thing she told me. And I'm like, wow, like that was the ideation that these people are, th are going. You say you having troubles, they're going to take your children. So, you know, I can understand why the ideation is there, but as clinicians and therapists, I can't be alone. And I say I, as in a black woman, as a black individual, can't be alone and saying, no, you guys should come, you guys should come, you guys should come. It has to be the other counterparts that come and say, hey, this is safe. Let me show you why it's safe. And so that's really our job as clinicians and as therapists and as people who work in mental health, even as case managers, you know, really making, um, therapy a priority if you feel like the person needs it you know and so you know my my mother is a very specific type of therapist so there tends to be more um shunning of I would say my substance abuse counselors and if you're one of them huge shout out to you guys I could never I have tried and I'm like so emotional because I'm like I just want you to get better so for people who can do that I applaud you um it's such a specialized population. And so when I think of alcohol and substance abuse um, and how much in the family, in the black family, you know, it has impacted us as a as a, a, a collective group, like as a system, substance abuse and drug abuse has really, really impacted the black community um, in our neighborhoods. And, you know, you know, a lot of our fathers are missing and our mothers are missing because of the 80s epidemic of um, the crack cocaine epidemic. So my hope is that my substance abuse counselors will really be gentle and thorough when they're explaining this part because, you know, like I said, African Americans have been beat up so much by the drug epidemic that that's really a sensitive, sensitive spot for us. And then on top of that, um, there's also, you know, the Tuskegee experiment and all that good stuff. And so those are other issues that come in with like drugs and all of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But like I said, that was just my little disclaimer for my substance abuse um, individuals, individuals who work with substance abuse to just, you know, really, really explain that to the family. That's so important. And then for our babies, our children, um, that's the best part, I think, is that when our kids go, they make it normal for us. Um, that's why I love working with kids. Most of my practices with kids. Um, I adored working with, you know, 90% black children. I love all children, by the way. But I got the chance to work with 90% of black children whose parents were involved in gangs and um, were, were incarcerated or they had been taken by the state. And just the kids would come to therapy and they would look forward to coming to therapy. And, you know, one of my kids said, you know, my mom said that people are only crazy when they come to therapy. And then she started going and then mom started going. And so it's just, it's a light at the end, the end of a very long tunnel of saying like, this is okay. It is okay to take care of your mental health and to be sane and to be, you know, need support. So that's another major barrier. Um, so we have access to care, not access to resources, except if you, I would say if you have an older, um, older client that access to resources and then understanding what mental health is. Um, and so the next one I want to move on to is distrust in medical care. And I say this with a lot of grief in my soul still, um, because when I think of like the distrust in medical care, it has caused the black community so much death um, by not accessing medical care. I mean, hypertension and heart attacks and strokes, they're so big in the African-American community. 
um, things like in the mental health part of it, bipolar and schizophrenia and autism. I speak of autism because that is one of the most under diagnosed um, diagnosis, underdiagnosed diagnosis in the African American community because we just, as a, a community, we just always, we don't know the signs. We know the kid is different and that's how we kind of label the kid is we're different, nah, it's different. But it leads us to a long time of having to fix the problem that could have been fixed a long time ago. And that's really because of the mistrust in the medical community. I mean, I had a long conversations with my boyfriend and my uncles and my dads. I have two dads, um, stepfather and father, but I call them my dads. You may hear about them every so often. Uh, I had a conversation with all of them in the same room and I asked them, do you guys go to the doctor? And all of them, all of them, every single one of them said, no, no, we don't go to the doctor unless our hand is falling off. Even then we'll try to fix it. And I asked them why. And they were like, we don't trust doctors. We don't trust medicine. And so to hear that was painful for me because, you know, as a woman, I'm always at the doctor. Like the minute I have an ache in my side, I'm going to the doctor. That's why I have amazing health insurance because <laughs> I'm always at the doctor. If I don't feel good, I'm going. Um, but to hear that they were not going because of such mistrust was really scary. Um, and so, you know, it's not just mistrust in the medical community, it's also mistrust in the mental health community. Um, and one thing that, that comes up for me is the Tuskegee experiment. And if you guys wanna know more about that, you guys feel free to Google it. Um, it's a lot more than I can share, but I'll give you the, the brief synopsis. Um, way back, I don't remember the exact years, but, um, African-American males were given a shot of syphilis and over that time they were almost guinea pigs so they were being studied to see how the syphilis affects them so the study ended but these these gentlemen were still sick and a lot of them passed away from just prolonged exposure to the syphilis virus even after there was a treatment for it um, many men passed it on to their wives and you know it just became this whole chaotic thing and so a lot of people sued and it just became this thing of like the the medical community can't uh, be trusted another uh, story that comes to mind is Henrietta Lacks um, she was uh, she had a, a gene or something that was considered um, a healing gene and so she was given, the gene was taken after she died and misused almost. They, they took her name and everything and misused it. And they could have saved her. She probably, you know, would still be around to tell her story. Her family is. But, you know, they took this gene from her and just recreated it and saved other people's lives which is wonderful, but it was a misuse of this patient's information. And so when we think of African-Americans accessing care, you really have to go back and you really have to say, generations after generations after generations have not obtained proper treatment because of the history that has come up in past. And so um, I, I'm looking at another study, which I quoted a little bit earlier, Tracy 2006, and this is about black men again, so I'll read you the whole quote this time, or the whole piece of the article. It says, black men tend to have negative views regarding therapy. In a study conducted by these researchers at four universities in Texas, so this was in 2006, so it's fairly recent, black men reported a higher level of negative views towards traditional therapy. Therapeutic distrust is often determined by a lack of trust in other people, i.e. white Americans. Let me hit a disclaimer this way. Most of these um, articles are directed towards white Americans um, or Caucasian individuals. And so what I'm gonna ask you guys is to be open-minded in this space and not take it personal um, because we're just, we're quoting the kind of privilege and the racism and how that kind of affects mental health. But I don't want anybody to be like, well, I didn't do that. <laughs> but it's just the views. And so I, I want to put a disclaimer on that before I continue. 
So, um, suspicions, thoughts about others, motives, uncertainty about the sequence of events, a feeling of powerlessness, and a fear of negative consequences. And that was by Bell and Tracy in 2006. Um, the last two, a feeling of powerlessness. I hear this a lot with my African American men. Um, they say that they feel like they're being emasculated. I hope that's the word. Um, are demasculated because they're attending therapy and they look weak. Um, this was given to me by a large group of black men. Again, I spent a lot of time with black men. Um, but, uh, I, I ran a group, a, a thesis group in college when I was graduating with my master's degree. And, you know, the men would not call it a therapy group. Even though it was a therapy group, they knew it was a therapy group. But they told me saying that they're in therapy is a no-no. And so they called it a focus group on black men issues. And I'm like, well, that's not what my paper is going to say. But I appreciate you guys giving it a new name. And so that group went on for a long time, but it just, it never had the name of like a, a group therapy. It was supposed to be, but it just, it didn't turn out that way. It was just a focus group on black male issues. And so they didn't want to call it therapy. And a lot of the times, you know, you'll hear a, a black person say, oh, I'm going to see someone. Or, um, you know, I'm going to go talk to somebody. It's usually not like I'm going to therapy. Like I said, now it's a little bit different. Um, it, it, it is, it is different, but still it's really hard to say like, Hey, I'm going to therapy. And that's with a lot of clients too. I've seen whether they're black, white, Latino, it doesn't matter. It's still really hard to go to therapy and put yourself out on the table. But to say it out loud is like, Oh my God, I'm like really going to therapy. I need therapy. Um, and another part of this that I thought was interesting was the sequence of events. So letting them know the process of therapy. Um, and that I think can really be done in your informed consent process. For those of you that have an informed consent, if you're working an outpatient, you should, but I think by like ethical law standards, you have to have an informed consent. But that's when that can really be brought up in the session is like the sequence of events. Maybe how long they're going to be in therapy, what you're going to be working on in therapy, their goals in therapy. I always ask my clients to um, give me two goals that they want to work on in therapy. Um, and so lucky for me, they're like, I want to work on X, Y, and Z. And I really take those goals and run with them. Okay, you say you want to work on this. So this is what we're going to do. Um, some other things, suspicion thoughts or of others' motives. Again, with just a heightened... Um, political state of the world, it's really hard to know who you can trust. And so when I think of, you know, African Americans and trusting people outside of their own race and even in their own race, you know, we have a lot of black on black crime and, you know, so it's hard to trust people, especially if you're coming from a place where, you know, you're always looking over your shoulder. You know, talking to somebody and giving somebody the most vulnerable parts of your life is very scary and it can be dangerous in certain parts. So just that, that lack of trust and that lack of empathy there. And so, um, a therapist can really work on that by, you know, just being upfront about everything, being upfront about your thoughts, your, your feelings, your, your views on what the client has said being up front and don't be afraid to challenge the client either you know um there's a lot that goes into being a therapist and and that means being empathetic and challenging at the same time and so that brings me to my last point um i feel like we've gone over a lot of points as to what can keep African Americans from coming to therapy and I hope you guys got a lot of the first couple points um, but the next point that I really want to kind of drag in and this one may be a little taboo if I say so myself <laughs> I don't know if I'm even allowed to say it I feel like my mom is gonna come to me and be like why would you put that in there but um, religion religion plays a big part in um, African Americans not accessing care. Again, that's changing. I would like to say that all of this is changing, which is awesome. Um, but just over time, and like I said, in my research and so on and so forth, religion plays a huge part in 
um, African Americans not accessing care. And so luckily for me, I have a pastor, I identify as Christian, um, but I love all religions. <laughs> I'm like, I love learning about religions. I love all religions. And so um, I say this with just my Christian values and you know what has gone on in my church. Anyway, so my pastor is a social worker. He is a social worker for probation and he has been a social worker for a very long time. He has a very high position in the probation uh, area in Los Angeles. And we have this conversation all the time, all the time, because his goal is to make African Americans understand that you can go see a therapist and you can still worship and believe that God is going to heal. And he said, you know, and he told me this when I was becoming a therapist, God gives people gifts. And so, or whoever you believe in gives people these gifts and these gifts are to be used. And so sometimes God or whomever you guys may believe in uh, gives you guys these gifts to be a therapist. And so I was like, oh, but it's not always that way. So if you're looking in, I'm, I'm speaking of more so African-Americans and blacks of the United States. If you look in history, um, the black church is like a staple in uh, black history. And, you know, there are other religions and practices um, that are done. You know, I, I know people who engage in, you know, um, voodoo and things of that nature. And so I'm... I'm Speaking to just a higher power in general, I know a lot of people have higher power. But when I think about church, I think of the Christian church um, because many African Americans identify as Christian. Uh, different types of Christian. You have your Seven Day Venice. You have your Baptist Christians. You have your um, non-denominational Christians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you have quite a few Christians in the African American community. And so, if you had any mental illness in the past, so we're going like far back past. If you had any mental illness, you were considered to have almost kind of the devil in you. So they weren't going to help you. They weren't going to send you to a therapist. They were going to pray the devil out of you. You know, so that's where you saw a lot of your exorcisms in the Catholic church and et cetera, et cetera. Because if you had any kind of mental illness, especially mental illnesses like schizophrenia or um, illnesses where you had auditory or visual hallucinations, those tend to be the ones that they wanted to pray out of you. And so over time, there was this long um, belief that if you had any kind of illness, you just need to go to church and God would heal. Now, like I said, I am never one to say that God will not heal. However, um, mental health treatment should be in collaboration with uh, praying in church and all of that good stuff. Why do I say that? Because you can do both. And so when I go back to my pastor, because he's one of the most prominent um, pastors that I know who does this, he will refer clients to me and be like, hey, you know, I prayed over this client. It's all good. Takes them. They need more therapy. <laughs> they need family therapy. Um, my church and so many churches around the world uh, offer AA, NA meetings because that's where people congregate. And so I truly believe that the church can be a place of um, congregation to have these mental health um, practices. But for so long, we haven't been utilizing the church because it's almost like church and state. Church is separate from mental health. You know, we, we pray it away and that's pretty much the gist of it. And so that's why a lot of your older African Americans won't, um, seek treatment because, uh, it's just, it's, it's not something that they were used to. Treatment was done in the church. And so, you know, when my grandmother, who, who recently passed, um, she got lucky enough to have a social worker before she passed away who I want to say really helped the family kind of grieve the possibility of her loss. And she, from what I know, she enjoyed the social worker. <laughs> so, um, you know, as time went on, she was accepting of it. And then even with me, she was accepting of, you know, I'm a therapist and I believe in God and I believe in both. And so she was like, oh, okay, I get it now. 
And so, you know, my older generations, though, they really believe if you go to church, everything will be okay, which is a wonderful belief to have. But I think in, in accessing the community, it's really important to um, say that there, there, there can be both. And so how that's done and how I see a lot of African-American therapists kind of going about it and even some Caucasian therapists do. I mean, you know, it, it, hey, <laughs> you want to go into church and do that, um, but really making themselves available in the church. So I know um, a few African-American therapists that run like AA and A groups in the church. Um, that help with like premarital counseling and therapy. Again, like I said, my pastor and some other pastors that I know around the area who are African American, they refer clients to us. Um, some of us therapists go into the church and do free services, free therapy services, um, just to kind of wear awareness. People teach classes, parenting classes, um, different things like that. So it's really about ways, raising the awareness more so than like you can't have God and you can't have therapy. Um, it's, it's, it's another awareness thing. It's another access to resources thing. So bringing those resources in the church is really important too. And so what I say is be delicate with somebody who has really high religious views. Um, don't discount God in their lives or don't discount their higher power or don't discount their beliefs, um, but just accept those and, and really think about and ask the client how those can go in tandem, how them receiving treatment and therapy can um, go in tandem with each other. I do want to know again that when we're talking about barriers to treatment, um, we also need to be aware of certain environmental factors, certain social factors, um, financial, et cetera, et cetera. So for instance, if you have a client who is in a lower SES or lower economic area, it may be harder for them to access uh, inpatient care. And so, I'm sorry, outpatient care. Uh, where so it may be a little bit easier for them to access inpatient care or care that's um, more accessible community-based wise. And so when we're speaking of access to outpatient care, it's really going to be in more of a community mental health setting or um, in an area where uh, resources are easily accessible. But when we're talking about outpatients, say in like a private practice situation or um, a situation where the client is self-paying, it can go either way as far as what could stop an individual from going to seek out private practice therapy. So some barriers tend to cross over uh, lines such as like religious uh, beliefs such as um, uh, un misunderstanding of the therapeutic community, etc. And so I think it's important to understand that while some cases may be different in an outpatient setting than a community-based setting, some are also the same. And so when we're talking about barriers, you know, we look at, you know, does the client have access environmentally or demographically to make it to outpatient therapy all the time? Or does the outpatient therapist have to come to them? Um, does the client have me uh, medical benefits? Do, does the client have county benefits? So those are things that we think of when we're talking about access to care. Um, and is going to a pastor, or going to a religious clergy really the only option for certain people? And so while we're looking at some of these things as barriers to care, they can also have the solutions to our problems. You know, like I said, my pastor um, is very active in the community and is a big role model in the community. And he offers therapy or therapy resources to individuals who may not have um, resources aside from the church. And so he brings in therapists, he has NA and AA groups, um, all the good stuff. So when I think of access to care and why it may not seem, you know, that big of a deal, 
it does come up in certain areas. Like, can this person meet their basic needs and even get access to care? Um, so when we look at some of the barriers, we have to see what are all the things that affect the barriers to treatment or what are all the things that keeps a client from coming into treatment or staying in treatment or transitioning out of treatment once they're completed, you know? And like I said, when we talk about things like inpatient and residential and PHP and IOP, uh, in a lot of areas, that's really foreign to people. Like, what is a PHP? I remember a client asking me, like, what, what is that about? <laughs> and so I had to explain it because these different levels of care and knowing what outpatient is, those are things that, you know, we're not taught in the community. And even in regular therapy, people are not normally taught in the community. So it requires a little extra knowledge and a little extra care and, you know, some good things to keep people focused on the goal. And so when I talk about barriers, I talk about what is it that, you know, we can do as clinicians, as therapists, as social workers, all the good stuff to ensure that these clients are able to meet the basic needs for their their next level of care, which could be going into inpatient, which could be going to outpatient. You know, it, it could be anything. And so how are we making it possible for people to access care? Could that mean in private practice, um, making a sliding scale or all the good stuff? And I'm not saying it's all financially based, but if you look into um, African-American culture, a lot of the times finances keep um, African-Americans, especially in lower SES uh, environments, from accessing care in a more consistent pattern. And so I think first and foremost, I really want everybody to just look at what it is that is keeping um, these clients from coming into care and is it something that we can handle as social workers, as therapists, as drug and alcohol counselors? Can we help them get the much needed access to care? And so that's going to be your job. That's always going to be your job in any setting that you're in is to make sure that you're coordinating care appropriately and making sure the clients get what they need. And so it's not just African-Americans that require this kind of work. It's also all people and all across all borders. So, you know, when I say barriers, I'm really talking about how we can fight against these barriers to make sure that people are getting proper access to care. Even when we feel like it may be difficult and it may be stressful and we may struggle with it. Um, my hope is that we continue to kind of go against these barriers and help these clients reach their full potential. And so um, two special considerations um, I really want to bring up before we end this portion of the module, um, the barrier portion of the module, is um, different targeted groups. And so one of the main groups that I have dealt with over time um, is the LGBTQ community, specifically the um, black LGBTQ community, again, because I just have access and resources to, to get to them. Um, and so in, a, in a, an article by Herrick and Capitino um, in 1995, so this is a little bit older, um, black heterosexuals will manifest more favorable attitudes towards lesbian gay men this is about men, again, to the extent that they have had personal contact with gay people. Um, so a therapist may find challenges associated with the commitment of a group setting um, when dealing with attitudes towards sexual orientation and race. Um, that, that intersexuality is, um, intersexuality, I can never say that word great, so just bear with me with that one. Um, it provides some stress in the the community um you know it's already hard enough being or identifying as lgbtq in the community in the black community there's a lot of arguments and just stuff that goes down um again it's generational and it goes back many many years and so i always want that to be a consideration that um youth of color 
um, individuals of color who identify as a part of the LGBTQ uni- u- community, I was going to say university, <laughs> community um, tend to access therapy treatments in an outpatient setting less than in an agency setting. And so we really want to change the um, views of that as well. And then also really engage them in groups because I feel like the the more community support that they have, that particular community, um, the better it will be. Um, and another special consideration I like to talk about is autism work. Um, again, it's something that is still kind of being learned in the African American community. You know, we have wonderful people like Tony Braxton um, and Holly Robinson Pete and people who identify as having children. Sean Stockman from Boys to Men, who's like my all time favorite. Um, they have children who identify as autistic. And so they're really a voice for us now, but just the not having the resources for um, learning what autism is for us. Even, autism is new in general and it's, it's starting to come up more, but in African American community, in my studies and in my talk with, um, different individuals, you know, they don't know what psychological testing is. They don't know what ADA is. And so it really is important that if you're doing that particular kind of work or you're referring to that type of work, then you really, 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 really have to explain yourself and explain what this work is and all of that good stuff. So those are my special considerations. Um, those are some of the barriers that come up in treatment. Um, I just want to thank you guys for bearing with me and listening to all the barriers and just my hope as therapists that we won't let the barriers stop us from giving these people exceptional treatment. Um, it has been shown in many, many studies that African Americans really do benefit from mental health treatment and it's so needed it's so prominent now in society like the the time is really now to like get the the treatment you know with with so much political distress like the time is now i tell therapists the time is is better than i mean it would have been awesome in like the 50s and the 60s too but like the time is now to engage you know these young hungry driven african-american youth who are really like, we're gonna go seek mental health treatment. I mean, you have all kinds of basketball players talking about it, singers coming out, rappers, oh, the rappers, that just makes my whole life. <laughs> you know, having rappers like Jay-Z come out and Kanye, even Kanye, <laughs> Kanye stresses me out a little bit, but having people like Jay-Z and Kanye come out um, and really talk about how mental health has affected them or you know um the young young man who passed away recently excess to nacion you know talking about how mental health has impacted him there's you know celebrities and all these people now who are really making it okay for the black community the african-american community to um access these resources and really go for seeking therapy and just not pushing it to the side you know that that's my favorite thing is when i have a young african-american person come into my my office and say like i needed this you know i needed to come here and i'm proud to be here you know it's it's an amazing feeling for me to just to just see the the fruits of the labor really coming about so please don't shy away from it um (laughs) sometimes we can be a little loud and projective and you know our family jumps into everything and all of that but you know really take it seriously because you could really be changing the course of what history looks like for you know african-american individuals i say it again and i'll continue to say it as an african-american woman like we cannot do this alone we need you know, allies and we need strong clinicians and uh, case managers and therapists to really step in and say, we are here with you. And so my hope is that you guys got something, anything out of this uh, module. I really hope that I have explained myself well on some of the barriers that keep African-Americans coming. My next two modules will be 
um, about how to engage them in the process once they come in and then how to end treatment and also what to use in different modalities to um, continue to engage them. And so I thank you again for listening. I wish you well on your post test. I hope that you can remember everything that I talked about <laughs> and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you again and I wish you so much luck in your future endeavors. You've just finished listening to another exclusive continuing ed podcast by Clearly Clinical. If you like what you just heard and you need continuing ed credits, please visit us at clearlyclinical.com to check out our one-year membership, where you'll have access to our growing library of continuing ed podcast courses. Clearly Clinical, where our goal is to help you learn, grow, and shine.